Last time, then, we started to look at uh, sums and quotients of vector spaces. So we first we looked at the external direct sum of two vector spaces. And then we looked at the sum of two subspaces of a vector space. And when the intersection was empty, had just zero in it, can't be empty, the intersection of two subspaces, when it was as small as it could be, then you ended up with the internal direct sum. And I pointed out that the connection between the external direct sum and the internal direct sum, which you can think about. And we have the notion of algebraic complements, uh, where if your space was a direct sum of two subspaces, then each one is an algebraic complement of the other. And the fact that every subspace of a vector space has got at least one algebraic complement, and of course usually lots of different ones, um, is, uh, follows from theory of Hamel bases. Of course, in finite dimensions, then it follows from the usual theory of taking a basis of one, taking a basis of your subspace and then extending it to give you a basis of the whole space. Um, and that helps you to find an algebraic complement. And that same procedure works in infinite dimensions as well, using Hamel bases. Then we start to look at quotient spaces. So we looked at being sort of equivalent modulo W. So W was a subspace of V, and then we defined when things were equivalent modulo W. In other words, uh, once you quotient out W, uh, you, you regard elements as the same if their difference is in W. And then you get equivalence classes, which are the same as these translates or uh, cosets or whatever you want to call them, depending on whether you're thinking of vector spaces or group theory. There is, of course, a strong connection. And then you look at the set of equivalence classes, and you put these operations on, and you check they're well-defined. And uh, let me remind you that you do need to check these operations are well defined. But this is standard theory. And then we have the quotient map, which maps V onto the quotient, V of W, which takes X to its equivalence class or takes X to X plus W. So X plus W, a typical element of the quotient space. It's a surjective linear map, and the kernel of it are those things which are mapped to the zero element. And this is the interesting thing. So the kernel of Q equals W as a subspace of V, but notice that the z what is the zero element of V over W? It is W. W regarded as an element of the quotient space because W is the equivalence class of zero. So, so notice that this is W regarded as a subspace of V, but also W is an element, um, well, W equals naught plus W is the equivalence class of zero. So that's in V over W. And so you could say W is a zero element of the quotient, but we normally write zero instead. Um, so in V over W, uh, w equals 0, and then you can regard it as equal to 0, which is how we normally think of it. You know, you normally think, you normally write 0 for the 0 <coughs> element. So it's a bit peculiar. If you want to be really clear, you would say it's a 0 element of V over W. So if you want to label your 0 elements by the space they're in, you can do that. Um, so this one is a zero in V, which is the equivalence class of zero in V, and you end up, that's a zero in V. Optional, of course, because you normally just write zero, but if you really want to clarify and know exactly where everything is, then the equivalence class of zero in V is the zero element of V over W, quotient space, which is, of course, in fact, the set W, but that's a very strange way to think about it. I don't normally think of W equals zero, because that sounds weird. 
And then you get a, a standard vector space isomorphism theorem. There are various standard vector space isomorphism theorems, and here's the one that's most useful to us. Um, whenever you've got a surjective linear map, you can quotient out the kernel and end up with a linear isomorphism. So how does it work? You assume you've got a surjective linear map from U onto V, where U and V are vector spaces over the same scalar field, of course. And then V is isomorphic to the quotient of U by the kernel of T. And if you use Q for the quotient map again, so that's this notation, or the equivalence class of X being uh, with the square brackets X, but normally I'd think of, I'd normally use Q for the quotient map, or X plus the kernel, then what does the isomorphism do? Well, it's got this formula here. T of X is equal to your isomorphism applied to the equivalence class of X. So what you have really is what they call a commutative diagram. So you've got U onto V using T, and you start with that as your surjective linear map. Then you quotient out by the kernel. So you've got the kernel of T down here. And that's a subspace of U, and there's the quotient map here. And then you complete this diagram with the map T tilde. And T tilde is your isomorphism. Uh, sorry. This is supposed to be quotient, the quotient map, so it should be U over the kernel. So Q takes X to its equivalence class, or to its coset, or to Q of X. Um, and then you have T of X equals T tilde of Q of X. So that's your commutative diagram. But what you, instead of having to write this composite symbol, because they're linear maps, you don't normally bother with the composition symbol, and you can just write T equals T tilde Q, which means that, and this is a special case of a more general phenomenon, that you can factorize through the kernel of your linear map. So you can, so you can always factorize through the, using the equation, you can factorize through the kernel, and you get a new linear map, but this linear map is one to one, but it's still on to. So this one is, uh, this one is uh, a linear isomorphism. So quotient out by the kernel to turn your map into an isomorphism if it was surjective. If it wasn't, so more generally, if T is not surjective, you can still define an isomorphism T tilde this way between U and the image of T. You still have um, that the image of T T of U is isomorphic to U over the kernel of T in the same way. Because T obviously is surjective when you regard it as a map from U to T of U. Um, so since TV is just another vector space, you can just use this same system there. Any questions about, the, about this? Again, I invite you to check the details. If, if any of it's unfamiliar, do check it in a, a linear algebra book. Ask me questions. Um, we can fill in more details. OK, so I now want to talk about subspaces of finite codimension because this especially codimension one, connects up really closely with linear functionals, which is an important part of functional analysis. It being called functional analysis, it's not surprising that functionals are quite important. So 
What does it mean to say that a subspace has finite co-dimension? Well, you may have seen various definitions of this in the past, but here is the safest one. This is why it, it should be the quotient space should be finite dimensional. Now, it's not obvious what the implications of that are, but uh, we're going to sit, look into that in a minute and say a bit more about it. Now, if it's finite dimensional, then of course it's got a unique dimension and you can count it. And you can figure this as a sort of, this is like the deficiency of your space U isn't quite as big as V, it's missing a few dimensions. And you want to know how many dimensions are missing. To count how many dimensions are missing, you take the quotient and you measure its dimension. And that's unique. Dimension of a vector space is unique. So the dimension of the quotient is unique and you can measure what's the co-dimension of your space. Of course, one possibility is zero. Um, if u equals v, then the co-dimension is zero. But that's not very exciting. We're mostly going to be interested in uh, co-dimension one. Now, this is, uh, this is an interesting exercise here, uh, which you should have a go at. You've got co-dimension n if and only if you can find an algebraic complement with dimen um, whose dimension is n. So that's um, that v equals u direct sum w, internal direct sum, for sum w with dim w equals n. But that's also equivalent to, by the way, as an extra part of the exercise, is also, that's if and only if, every algebraic complement of u has dimension n. So every algebraic complement of U in your big space V has dimension N. So there's actually some subtle stuff going on here. Um, for example, co-dimension 1. Most people, in fact, think of co-dimension 1 in the following way. They think of it as you can find some one-dimensional subspace um, so that when... You, uh, that gives you an algebraic complement. And that's how most people think of co-dimension 1. But then you're faced with the problem, how do you know that a space of co-dimension 1 can, might not also have co-dimension 2? Why should all the algebraic complements have the same dimension? Um, how would you go about checking that all algebraic complements of a subspace have the same dimension? Well, the answer is they're all isomorphic to the quotient space. Whenever you've got an algebraic complement, it has to be isomorphic to the quotient space, and that follows from the vector space isomorphism theorem. Um, so let's have a look at that. Um, notice every algebraic complement is isomorphic to the quotient. Um, it's isomorphic. to V over U because uh, you can look at um, now let's try and get this right let's look at the map V goes to W defined by U plus W gets mapped to W. 
Now, what's going on there? Um, this is for U and W, uh, U and U and W and W. Because it's a direct sum, every element of V is uniquely in this form, U plus W. So this is a well-defined thing, and um, it's projection onto W in some sense. It's not any sort of orthogonal projection, but this is, you can figure this as projection onto W according to this decomposition. So you've got this projection onto W, and it's surjective, and the kernel is U. So by the isomorphism theorem, you just quotient out by U and you get an isomorphism. So uh, let's give this, let's call this something. Let's call it P for projection. Um, kernel of P equals U and P is onto So W is isomorphic to V over kernel of P, which is V over U. So every algebraic complement is isomorphic to V over U, which means they all have to have the same dimension. And I've pretty much done the exercise for you. You can fill in the details. And our related exercise to that is a special case of co-dimension 1, when when you interpret all the statements above, this is what you get. To have co-dimension 1 in V, then of course, um, oh yes, notice that the statement here requires the assumption that U is not equal to V. Because B actually is true when U equals V as well, yes? Yeah? Uh, oh, yes, sir? Uh, yes? You said that the two are equivalent, but the Which one? The, the question, the exercise, and the question. This one here, the, the, red, and the, the red and the blue, yes. Yeah. Uh, so so what I did here was I've shown that every algebraic complement is isomorphic to V over U. So, that we can always find yes, and that uses the theory of Hamble bases. So, that's right. So, I'm assuming the actual a choice in there. But we will do that in, in this module. But you're quite right. Um, the, to get from for, for every to there exists requires that there is at least one, <laughs> um, which requires the actual a choice in this case. So you are right. So a special case of codimension one, so that's that the quotient is one-dimensional, but it also means that um, the space has got a one-dimensional algebraic complement. Um, it also means that every algebraic complement is one-dimensional. And the result that you better have u not equal to v. If u, equal, if u equals v, statement b happens to be true, but, but uninteresting because it's vacuous. So, so you want to restrict attention to u not equal to v in this statement, which is why I've got that thing in the red box there. So if u not equal to v, then you've got co-dimension 1, if and only if, for every v outside, and you know there's at least one now, um, then... Basically, you've got a one-dimensional subspace that sums to you. This is um, u plus the linear span of v equals v. But notice that that's automatically a direct sum. Um, because if v is not in, if v is not in u, then none of, uh, none of its multiples are either apart from zero. So 
So it's actually u direct sum lin v as well. And this one is for everything outside that happens, and this is that there exists one outside. But again, it's the same thing that uh, this is saying that again, this is saying this is even only if um, v equals u direct sum linear v since v is not in u. So that's the two versions again. One is that there is, uh, there is an algebraic complement and one is that um, with the right dimension and the other that all the algebraic complements have the right dimension. Yes? Uh, sorry. No, okay. Yeah, okay. So any questions about what we've been saying there, quotients, compliments. Any questions at this time? I hope that most of that has been either revision or similar to stuff you've seen before, but with maybe the existence of adriatic complements, as I say, is a bit trickier because it involves Zorn's lemma and Howell basis, and it's something for you to go away and think about. And that brings us to the end of that section. So, again, any final questions on anything in that section? If not, we'll stop the recording there and move on to the next section.